Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today on day three of Special Operators Week is Thomas Colbert. He's an investigative journalist, TV producer, and author. Along with Tom Salasi, he co-authored the book The Last Master Outlaw, how he outfoxed the FBI six times, but not a cold case team. That book details the investigation Thomas organized about today's featured special operator, Robert Rackstraw, who, as it turns out, was the master heist man and perhaps the world's most mysteriously famous paratrooper, D.B. Cooper. Now, wait a minute. Did you not know that D.B. Cooper's identity had been discovered? Well, Thomas Colbert has known it for years and had racked up the proof. The investigation involved at least 47 retired investigators, including a dozen FBI agents. The week before his team would have turned their evidence over to the FBI case agent, the FBI closed the case. And that event became the subject of the History Channel documentary, D.B. Cooper, Case Closed, that Tom also produced in 2016. Now, he was introduced to us and is joined on the show by Eric Kleinsmith, who was instrumental in the investigation by way of constructing the timeline against which four decades of evidence was organized. It's not an overstatement to say that Eric Kleinsmith was able to make sense and help everyone else make sense of such a mountain of disparate information. He also had another big job in his career. He had been Pete's commanding officer in Bosnia. Now, you're about to hear some of the fascinating details of this story and the investigation that led to its uncovering. But first, a word about Special Operators Week. We're celebrating it coming up to Pete's Diving in the Water this Saturday for the Coronado Swim to support the SEAL Veterans Foundation. If you want to support Pete and the SEAL Veterans Foundation, go to sealveteransfoundation.org. And if you're in the San Diego area, Go see Pete at Coronado Island this Saturday. It'll be a fun event and inspiring for sure. We do this along with our ongoing support for Save the Brave. And you can read about them at savethebrave.org. Our co-producer, co-host Scott Husing is on the board of Save the Brave, and they do great work there too. Now Scott stays in great shape, and Pete and I realize that hanging around with him and all the operators we have on the show, that we need to get in shape. So Pete started training in the pool, and I started training in the gym. He's doing the Coronado Swim on Saturday, and I'm doing a Diablo Barbell Body Comp Challenge that concludes on Sunday. And I'll reveal the results of that challenge on Monday's episode, so stay tuned. And as always, if you have comments on our progress, or if you want to share your fitness goals and your progress, chime in. Leave us a comment on YouTube or on the website, wherever you listen to us. While you're at it, give the Break It Down show a five-star rating and write us a little review. We appreciate all of that stuff. Now, with the real story on the fable that has captivated us for generations, here's our guest today. Here are our two guests today, Thomas Colbert and Eric Kleinsmith. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. My name is Tom Colbert, and this is the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. This is an interesting one and very timely. Do 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 do. Breaking <laughs> news coming down. Uh, a little bit crowded here on the Break It Down show, and I, I'm sort of uh, driving the reins here just to get us on the way. So we have Tom, of course, who's a guest, and he's going to blow your mind with this worldwide story that broke yesterday. And then, uh, of course, uh, I've got John Leon Guerrero sitting in because I told him that we were going to do this show, and he said I'm not missing that. So. We're, John is still in the room with us, and also Spy vs. Spy style, we've got uh, Eric Kleinsmith, who's going to his upcoming episode. It will be at the, the last day of the month on the 30th, and Eric was my commander in Bosnia, so he is a, uh, a spy, a spy commander, and just a, a dude I, I love reconnecting with because he's done some remarkable things, and he ultimately is helping produce this episode by linking me to Thomas, and he actually has worked on Get this, the D.B. Cooper case. 
Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. Get this, the D.B. Cooper case and his work was instrumental in Tom being able to to figure out finally and, and give us some answers on who D.B. Cooper was and what the heck was going on. So I'm, I'm going to leave some space for Eric to kind of set the stage and we'll get going. All right. Thanks for having me again. The, uh, the, I guess the first time together did well enough, so that I'm glad you, you asked me to come back on. So good to go. <laughs> I'll, I'll set the stage for this. And, and I met uh, Tom Colbert. And Tom is, you know, is, as much as I knew about this guy, it was uh, I had a, a, a email relationship with a, a gal named Shannon Ross Miller. And after 9-11, and just for background on her, Shannon Ross Miller was the, is the youngest uh, judge in – uh, is it national? She's a, she was a judge out of Montana, but she was the youngest uh, female judge in U.S. history. And after 9-11, broke her hip and was laid up, but became so incensed with the attacks on 9-11 that she took it upon herself to create and do invest her own investigations online and taught herself uh, Arabic, taught herself, I think, Farsi as well. And um, it created up to two dozen online personas uh, in order to enter into chat rooms and talk to individuals that were planning uh, uh, jihadi attacks against the U.S. Uh, post 9/11, uh, I'm you know as I was in the middle of teaching and and running a counterterrorism analysis course for the Army, it was only natural for me to link up with her, and in doing so, I was introduced to Tom Colbert, um, who's with us, and and Tom was as much as I knew about this guy. He's like, well, this he's a producer uh, for investigative journalism, investigative uh, shows out of California. And uh, we'd all like to get together. And we ended up uh, meeting in downtown D.C. on a couple of occasions. And I've since met with uh, Tom. And this is you know, uh, at least Tom was at, ten, at least 10 years ago. Oh, I think it was closer to 15. Yeah, yeah, it's it's getting there. And uh, I, I want to add on Shannon Rossmeller. She's responsible for over 200 cases of actionable intelligence and takedowns around the globe with uh, the intelligence agencies. Right. Phenomenal right. woman. Right. Phenomenal. I mean, key of those cases are uh, it was a plan to uh, blow up the Alaskan oil pipeline. She was able Correct. to interdict that as well as. A uh, U.S. Army soldier who was getting ready to deploy and had decided to join the jihadi cause and collect information about uh, classified vehicles as well as uh, operational data on his base camp in Iraq, the layout and what was who was there and everything else. And she was able to compile these cases amongst all the others and just turn them right into the local FBI field office in Montana. And that's you know, and it was enough of, of her involvement for her to write. Uh, a book, I think it's called Uncommon, is it Uncommon Patriot? I can't remember the exact title, but it's something Patriot. <laughs> right, right. <That's laughs> Which right. is what she is. That's all you right. have to know. Correct. And so, yeah. and so working with Tom on this and some other, some other, I want to call it pro bono work, it was 2011 that Tom called me. Uh, and I was in the middle of a proposal time for, you know, working for uh, Lockheed Martin for a government proposal. And I get a call in the middle of the middle of the proposal room. It says, "Hey, I got this case, and I, I really think this is something." And I say, like, "All right, let's lay it on me. What is it?" And it's uh, Tom says, "Well, it's we think we think we may have found the, the true identity of DB Cooper." And I and I was so taken aback that I said fairly loudly in the room, "I said last time I checked, he was dead." And <laughs> and all the folks that were in the room just kind of stopped what they were doing and looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I knew right then, all right, this is something I want to get involved in. And mm -hmm. so that's, you know, I've, I've been helping Tom ever since, but I, I, I really only, you know, Tom assembled 47 plus people on this. And I'll let him go into the background of how he put this case together. I only performed the intelligence analysis piece, which we'll get into later. Uh, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to hand it off to Tom and just tell me that you go into the quick backstory and, and, and how you got this thing going. Well, is, thanks, Eric, and, and that was a good summary. And, and you know, Eric was one of the first go-to guys on the team. As long as she, and Shannon Rossmiller became part of the cyber team, 
I mean, it's uh, this this all evolved. As I said earlier, my my skills were at CBS News O&O in Los Angeles, owned and operated station KCBS. I was a senior uh, researcher for close to 10 years working for people like Lester Holt uh, as a rookie reporter, Connie Chung, uh, Paula Zahn uh, over on Discovery uh, now. We all had our roots there. And my roots on the Cooper case actually began when I was 13, when I saw my dad with the newspaper on his lap. And there was the big headline, and he explained it to me as a kid going into high school. Uh, Then I go into college and get a journalism internship at KCBS, and there's the footage coming in on the money being found on the Columbia River in 1980. And then I would take all the calls of people, oh, it's my uncle, it's my husband on his deathbed. I'd get those Cooper calls late at night as a researcher. That went on until I created my own true story company where I would find documentaries and movies. And that's when I got a call from a uh, former drug runner who happened to be on that river, the Columbia River, in uh, 1979, 1980, and he was at a party. And he, this drug runner, his drug dealer, was claiming to be Cooper for over a year up there in 1980. And one day at a party on the river in an apartment, a cocaine party as it was described, the dealer turns to the runner and, and his partner and says, you see that shoreline over there? I know you don't believe who I am. I'm going to prove it to you. He was claiming to be Cooper. He said, on that shoreline on the north side in four days, a kid and his parents are going to find some of my money. Well, just like you and I, we all just, they rolled their eyes and said, sure, boss, sure, boss. And sure enough, four days later, after their drug run, they're in, in, in of all places, Reno, where the uh, escape ended in the aircraft. And they're in a hotel in 1980, and they turn on the news. There's that boy and his parents claiming they found the money on that shoreline. Well, this is what he told me. And that's when we began this journey in 2011. Wow, that's quite a beginning. Uh, yeah. I'm going to rewind a little bit just for our audience because sure. somebody out there doesn't know who D.B. Cooper is. And just in brief, he hijacked a plane. He yep. uh, collected a ransom of about $200,000. And then somewhere over uh, somewhere between Portland and Seattle, uh, jumped out of the plane with a parachute and was never found. So what we have here is a case that involves a, a, a heist and missing money in the middle of the woods and an unsolved case. So this intrigues everybody. And yeah. if, if anybody's unfamiliar with this case, this, this case has, has been on a lot of people's minds and tickled a lot of people's imaginations for 50 years. So the fact that you had uh, this really hot tip that had an incredible coincidence suddenly mm-hmm. sparks uh, your imagination as well. And now you have to act on a tip that involves a mountain of data that is yes. long. So yes. please take it from the, there. <laughs> yeah. The first step of course was to my wife and I decided that we're going to need help. And, uh, I had been teaching besides being in the media, I've been a police fire military intelligence trainer at camp L- San Luis for 17 years in central California and San Luis Obispo. I was recruited by the State Office of Emergency Services because I had a great relationship with academies and fire departments and police departments, and they recommended me. And they flew me up once a month for 17 years, teaching classes like crisis management, terrorism, hazmat, so forth. Well, around the water cooler up there, for for all those years, I kept hearing they found uh, a three stacks of money still with their bank rubber bands corroded, but still there from 1971, half buried in the sand in 1980. And no one here is going to argue that they casually just happened to show up. Well, that's when the police department, I should say the FBI, that's when the FBI announced, well, apparently Cooper drowned here, and that's why his money's washed up. Well, none of the guys believe that. I didn't believe it. So when suddenly I get a call from a drug runner saying, I can explain to you what happened, I turned to my wife and I said, we know who did it. Now we just have to get rid of all the, the gobbledygook and find out how. 
Nice. Uh, and I've and that day on, I knew. And I and you know, I've I've I, it, being a senior researcher, I know exactly. Uh, as as one cop told me, there are three people that don't believe in coincidences: cops, uh, investigators, and and parents of teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> There's no coincidences, and that's when we knew we had something. And I spent the first eight months on the wrong guy, and that was the drug dealer. And then I find out from uh, people he went to school with and so forth, he had died months after that planting of the money, a single car accident on a remote road outside Portland. Hmm. And and we're just, you know, it's getting more interesting well, then I started calling. Uh, I called all the uh, the drug-related folks who are now our old men, and I finally get a guy who says, you should call the cops. You're not going to have any luck here. And I did. I called and said, do you guys have any old narcs uh, at Portland PD? And sure enough, I get a call from an almost 80-year-old guy, homicide guy, and he says, look, I heard you're looking into Briggs. I actually didn't bust him. I grew up with him. He was in my grammar school. And he wound up driving a, a driving a Rolls Royce and a cocaine dealer. Is that the guy you're looking for? And I said, that was the first time I looked up and said, thank you, Jesus. Total wow. coincidence that he called me. And he gives me access to a dozen of the people he grew up, frat brothers, everything else. And the first thing we realized after eight months, he couldn't have done it. He was a party boy. He was not sophisticated. And when I'm calling law enforcement and I'm calling uh, people that don't, you know, know what I'm doing, I'm not saying, hey, I'm looking into Cooper. I'm saying, hey, I'm calling about Briggs, this drug uh, dealer. Uh, could he have taken down a train? Could he have robbed a bank? The, the total answer was, he's, no, he's a goofball. All he did, he was a middleman for the drug cocaine uh, cartels in Colombia. And so I was stuck, and I realized I had the wrong guy. Well, I made one more call. And this was a frat brother who happened to be one of, um, a major basketball player in college. In fact, he, hold, he held the uh, number, highest number of points in high school until, what's his name, Kevin Love? I think his okay. name was Love. Yeah. Uh, had broke it a few years ago. So he had fame in bars. His name, you'll love this, his, his, his nickname is what they adopted. His name is Pudgy Hunt. <laughs> I heard that name Pudgy Hunt. And I said, I'm going to make this my last call because I watched too many movies where a guy behind a bar pulls out a shotgun with the name of Pudgy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sure enough, I call him and, you know, gruff is, hello. And I, well, I'm actually calling on it and, and I'm down to my last call. So I'm just going to be honest with you. You know, Dick Briggs, and he just turned into a puppy dog. He said, I loved Dick Briggs. He was a wonderful guy. He, he was a nut. He, he got high. He became a drug dealer, but I still loved him since college. And I said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. People have said he could have been Cooper. And suddenly he, he just laughed and he said, Dick, Dick Briggs was a party boy. There's no way he was Cooper. And my, my shoulders sunk. But then I get my next thank you, Jesus moment. Pudgy says, but you know, we were working laying floors at different colleges, including the one in Pepperdine in California. And I introduced my friend Dick to a manager on the team who was a former Vietnam vet. In fact, he used to be a D.B. Cooper suspect by the name of Robert Rackstraw. Wow. And that's how we found Rackstraw. The next Jesus moment came with the Stockton papers because I knew that he, the only article online was about him being cleared, uh, being a, a D.B. Cooper suspect, an old AP article from 78, 79. So I called the Stockton librarian and she says, you know, we all we have are old papers on sticks in the library and they only go back about 20 years. Well, then I get a call three days later from the librarian. She says, I don't know how it happened, but there's a paper sack up here with 50 clips on Rackstraw and his trials in Stockton. Wow. <laughs> so she sends me these, lays them all down, sends me, and we have the whole inside to Robert W. Rackstraw, a guy who had 22 identities, 33 different crime titles, and uh, uh, traveled in five countries around the globe, and a CIA connection was laid out. And that was the last thing we saw and developed. So what, what cleared him anyway? 
How did they, how did they eliminate him? Oh, boy. There's a, a wild one, right, Eric? <laughs> well, bottom line is uh, we were lured into, we put together our team with the uh, former students at Camp San Luis, people like Eric, uh, referrals from news people I knew to make this incredible team, a task force really of 40, uh, led by 13 former FBI guys. And, you know, 1,500 years of of brain power to put this together. Uh, so we prepared for in secret uh, for three, four years, gathering up evidence, almost 100 pieces of the, every type of evidence you could think of, including DNA, including letter trails, uh, a letter trail that went to his getaway house up in the Sierra Nevada mountains within 20 minutes of it and 500 miles from the crime scene. <laughs> two of the two of the six letters mailed within 20 minutes of his remote house. Um, and one of our FBI guys said, this is an eight out of 10. I mean, they were getting very, very excited. So we decided it was time to approach a, a, a legitimate documentary outlet. We went to History Channel. They were interested, and in, in the short story is they wanted to make this uh, all about Rackstraw and uh, all about uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, hunt for this man. Uh, and so they lured us in. Uh, they wanted to have the FBI on camera. They wanted to include them so they could look at our evidence. Uh, we got a deputy director of the FBI retired to review our evidence for three days, and he said, this is the greatest case I've ever seen. Uh, he said that uh, you're going to be sitting with the FBI guys. In fact, you'll be going up there. We got very excited. Well, in the negotiations for six months to work on this documentary, we had no idea but the FBI uh, was doing something that was not legitimate. They were uh, horse bartering with the evidence. And by the time, we, a week before the final day of shooting, we were led to believe that we were going to present our case and meet with the FBI as this former assistant director had said we would. No, they put us on camera and said, look, we're closing the case. Uh, we're concerned about a 50-year-old case. Uh, and uh, we're not going to accept your evidence. We're going to cancel our arrangement with you, and we're taking the file and putting it in the archives in Washington. You remember the scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark? That's where it went. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Into hey, those long aisles, and we've got we were stunned. Our mouths were down. But a, that's week, when, a week prior to the closing. Of the the last shooting day of the of the documentary, which was in April. It didn't air till uh, July, and we had to contractually not talk till then. Well, we prepared ourselves. And the evidence they offered, they mentioned, uh, when your audience does get a chance, they need to go up to dbcooper.com. My very smart wife got that website. And they will see under um, on the articles at the very top is something called the smoking gun on the FBI and DB Cooper. They will see all the releases, uh, the 10 releases uh, since this documentary of what we've done since, and that will open their eyes to what we did. And that is when the FBI said the only way we'd reconsider opening this uh, is if you find the parachute of the money. Well, then we it aired in July. We saw they took the top 18 pieces of evidence out of our case. They made it a show about the history of D.B. Cooper, and they put a half dozen knuckleheads and characters up in the air that claimed to be D.B. Cooper. And, oh, yeah, a sliver of it was on Rackstraw. They bushwhacked us. So we uh, started putting out information. Uh, my wife and I realized these volunteers that we have uh, were just disgraced by this operation. And we decided we had to spend more time. So we spent the next two years digging. And the first thing we get is a former cop up in the Northwest who tips us to where the escape was and where the parachute was buried. Hmm. And, and we found the parachute. We found five pieces of it. We had the team. We had some forensic experts go out there. We delivered it to the FBI in, in August of 2017. Their mouths were down, literally. They had to accept it because of the media pressure, and the FBI has not talked to our team since. 
and, and understand that this, this history uh, channel documentary was a two part piece. And so the first two part, part piece, right? Yeah. The first part kind of built, built up the investigation, but it was like the last 20 minutes of the second part as, as, as you know, anybody who's a layman that's interested in this and, and then looks at it, the last 20 minutes is, it's kind of like they go back and, and leave intentionally leave doubts all over the, the, you know, all over the investigation. And I don't know if it's to, to keep them from being sued or uh, whether it's, you know, they, they receive the inside stories. Like, look, you guys aren't going to, you guys aren't going to leave this def- as a definitive answer. You're going to leave it open ended. And as a question like, like ancient aliens or something weird like that. So it looks yeah, more and like that's, a conspiracy theory than, than an actual documentary. Yeah. And I don't mean to step on you, Eric, but oh. bottom line is, is that, is that the book, The Last Master Outlaw, is where you can see the whole story, the bushwhacking, the cover-up, and everything else, uh, all the way up to the end of the documentary. And that explains what exactly happened. And after we found the parachute, then one of uh, Rackstraw's dozen, we tracked down a dozen of his Vietnam vet brothers, and they were involved in an intelligence gathering for a very sophisticated unit in Vietnam. Well, hold on. One let, of the guys... me, I, I don't want to get past the parachute part because. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. So here's one of the craziest cold cases ever. We don't know who it is. We're assuming this guy's dead. And 45 years later, you guys find the parachute. I mean, that's just yeah. man, that is crazy. And is it is this bulletproof that the that's the parachute? Well, let me tell you what happened. Um, We were told the escape story. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I, after the documentary Bushwhacking, we held a news conference and announced we were suing the FBI. And Eric was one of our East Coast guys standing with me outside a federal court in D.C. when we sued the FBI, FOIA, took a half year and we won. We have full access uh, to the FBI file, and we get it every month, about 500 pages. Now, of course, they've been redacting the hell out of it. You wouldn't believe it. They're redacting streets, towns, uh, locations. They even any reference in the FBI memos to D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper is being taken out as a prefix on the letters. Wow. It's pathetic. And we're like... 47 years later, what are these people doing? Why? What is this about? Well, then we got sent the so-called six letters. Four of them were publicly known, and they were, uh, ha-ha, you can't find me letters by someone claiming to be Cooper. One of my Vietnam guys looked at the letters. He recognized ancient army codes, and he said, this guy was in my unit. And we knew that because we gathered up his unit. And I said, we can read this code. He's, he's sending messages in all six of these letters. When your audience goes up to dbcooper.com and, and looks at the letters, they're going to be blown away because he literally confessed in the letter. This is what a narcissist does. One of our experts, former FBI, is a psychologist. And he said, this is exactly what a narcissist does. He puts things in thinking he, no one will figure it out. Well, our 1,500 years beat him. <laughs> okay. And the other and thing I want to ask broke it. is, yeah. uh, and, and this might be a question that Eric can help me understand because he's seen this stuff, but we have the assumption that Rick Straw had the, the proper capabilities to do this, but this, this jump happened at a pretty high speed, you know, at a different altitude. And mm-hmm. what I know about airborne operations, if you are, uh, you know, if you are airborne, you are static line jumping out of an airplane. That is something that's completely different than what he does here. So how do we how do we get him? Does he have hey ho, halo, other kind of secondary yes. jump training? Yes. No. Eric, you want to go into that? Right. Well, the, the, one of the big differences was that in, in standard airborne, if you go to standard Army Airborne School, uh, you know you're you're doing your training jumps uh, at about you know twelve hundred feet or something like that. So, but it's a static line jump. As soon as you jump the uh, your your actual parachute, the rip core is actually attached to the a cable inside the aircraft. So when you jump, that's what opens your chute up. Um, I mean, standard in any you know you see it in any air movie that involves airborne. For Cooper though, the aircraft that he chose actually had a stairs that would that lowered down to, to the rear of the aircraft. And so when he had private, you know, when he was left alone and he forced the crew up to the front of the aircraft, he was there by himself for 45 minutes before he lowered those stairs and jumped. 
it's a much easier jump out the back because of the you know the prop wash and the, and the speed of the aircraft and things like that. And the crew did note that they 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 did feel a, 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 a significant decrease in the way of the aircraft once he left and things like that. And that's just written. So it, it is entirely just from a, a survivability standpoint. Anybody that and he's and this guy was airborne qualified. Uh, actually, was an aviator as well. Um, so, so he had intimate knowledge and to the ability to do that, especially out, you know, and if he knew anything about this, this aircraft that he chose specifically, it was not a hard thing to do. I might add too, that, uh, we have about a dozen of Rackstraw's family members from three families befriended, and they've been feeding me information from the past and current. And one of the things that was claimed by Rackstraw to a family member, and I trust this family member, uh, he's, uh, he's worked with us for a long, long time. Uh, he said to us that uh, Rackstraw was a halo jumper. He learned how to do it, and he used to get on what he described as the white 727s in Thailand. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. The White 727s in Thailand. That, that seems like that's not regular Army stuff. No, it's uh, Air America stuff. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. were dropping him. So, so he was, and he even bragged that he would fall, they trained him to fall into trees and rocks. Well, this is the thing. And, and you know, as a counterintelligence guy and a guy that knows how some of this stuff works, and granted, I didn't work on the strategic side, but you don't have multiple families and access to all these things. You know, like, yeah, you might be a con man, but, but just that much access to that many different places and things and training. There's, there's, he's, I, look, he's working for an agency of some kind, has to be. Yeah, yeah. And he met him in the officer's club at First Cav. And it was, he was working a, a, work, a chopper repair unit that was also the Uber of the uh, First Cav at that time, flying dignitaries around. And he had time on his hands. And look, there was no logging in, logging out. There was no, uh, no uh, following uh, people on missions. They went out into the jungle at days at a time. Rackstraw met a CIA operative in the officer's club, according to his former lieutenant colonel. And he watched him go out in a stolen commander's jeep with a rat patrol machine gun on the back full of explosives for days at a time on two separate missions. We also have another chopper pilot from that unit watching him meeting at the Green Beret refueling stop on a mountain in the middle of Vietnam. So he was out on his own constantly with the CIA. And of course, after the jump, he went to Laos. He also, we've been told by sources in military intelligence now, three separate sources have come to us saying, yeah, we knew he was Cooper and he was working for us. And he was heavily involved also in Iran-Contra. Wait a second. <laughs> this guy's like the Forrest Gump of Intel operations from the 70s hey, and 80s. You, 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 <laughs> just mentioned a, you just mentioned a funny line. Let me tell you. Guess who flew the general into the Cambodian incursion? Robert Rackstraw. He's everywhere in history. He was in Iran Contra when he ran away. He was also in Iran during the hostage, just before the hostage situation, training the Shah's pilots in the last year of the Shah. I mean, it's a phenomenal story. Uh, never mind a crime. It's a phenomenal story of a off the scale genius. It's, it's just it goes on and on. And uh, it makes more and more sense why certain people in certain places would probably not want that story to be told. <laughs> well, look, and I, Eric and I have voiced this before. We're not here to question our warriors in the shadows who are keeping us safe. We're questioning why one came home with 33 criminal titles and, and 22 identities and just thumbed his nose at the system. That's what yeah. we're appalled. That's what we're appalled. And and it seems like he was uh, sort of ignored. I mean, I don't want to say allowed to run amok, but at the at the very at the very that's at the very worst. At the very least, he was ignored. 
that's that's a true characterization of it and and remember it's uh he was finally identified by local cops who tipped off the FBI who found him in Iran and brought him back he refused to get off the plane at JFK they had to drag him out they asked him if he was Cooper and he said I want my lawyer and and that was the beginning of the investigation on him in California about a about a dozen agents up and down the state and also in Oregon and Washington talking to ex-crime partners, family members, and so forth. And then suddenly in February 79, a year after he was caught in Iran, the Seattle uh, paper, Seattle Times, is leaked by the, uh, by the FBI that Rackstraw has been cleared. We have found the biggest insurrection in the FBI history nobody knows about. Six of those 12 agents went to separate newspapers, and as one said it to me, we told the papers this is not true, he's a suspect, and it's not been cleared. Those six agents, one of them joined our team. <laughs> Hold on, I have my hand in the air. i got to ask. <laughs> I uh, see it. <laughs> did you say that Rackstraw was in Iran in 1979? In the yeah, last year of the Shah. Totally, yeah, he, he, normal. He, totally normal. Totally yeah, normal well, for that to happen. Well, weren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was uh, uh, being chased by California authorities for check kiting, hoarding explosives, and so forth. And he, his lawyer leaked to him the charges were coming. So he got on a plane, went to Hawaii, called the only defense company in the Middle East at the time. What was the chopper company, Eric? Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember the name, but he, he uh, um, flew into this chopper company, started there, and after a week and a half, the FBI were tipped that he was there. And you'll love this. Oh, uh, was it one of, one of the people? No, no. Uh, okay. Bell Helicopter, oh, Bell sorry. International. Okay. And they were the only ones in the Middle East training the Shah's uh, pilots. So what happened after that is one of my cold case team members in 1978-79, when Rackstraw was missing, uh, his, by the way, his stepdad was missing. The man who hid him after the jump was missing. So a PI was hired by Rackstraw's extended second-generation English family. And the Rackstraw family hired this PI in his 40s, and he goes looking, and he finds not only the burial spot of the stepdad that Rackstraw killed, and I can say killed because several of the family members say he got away with murder. Uh, they, he, he had, they found the body, and then this PI goes into the bars and finds out Rackstraw's in Iran. He's the one that tipped the county sheriff who tipped the FBI to go get him. That man... That 47-year-old PI is on our cold case team at 85 years old. <laughs> Just to show you what we could do with these people that are no longer working. They're, they're amazing. Wow. And he still, he, he is the uh, called the dean of uh, private eyes in San Francisco. He still, he and his wife, still run the service full-time, smart as hell. And wow. and Jack Emmendorf is his name. And Jack was the one that found Rackstraw on Iran for the FBI. And then, as I said, a year later, suddenly they cleared him. Suddenly there was a revolution that no one knows about in the FBI. And uh, he's been out since. The, and by the way, when he walked out of jail, he had two years for local charges. He walked out after one year. Months after he walked out, they found that money on the shore, and the FBI announced, well, it looks like Cooper drowned. Hmm. And that's how he cleared under his own name. Hey, Eric, who's who's Rackstraw's handler? <laughs> you know, well, here's the thing. is is, And, and this is a, a great way to sum it up. So you have, you know, pr guys doing proper investigations, trailing this guy, building the case you know, against him, you know, gathering evidence. And all of a sudden, they run up against another agency that said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is our guy. Stop. You know that's that's essentially what it what it turns into, and so, you know, when when the when it's all said and done, to find out about you know this true story will finally lay out once the statute of limitations ends on you know covert cases like whatever he was working, and you know Pete, you and I both know that's going to be around seventy years after the fact that uh, when, when somebody can finally step forward and say, yep, right. this guy was our guy, you know, just like the Venona papers that came out on uh, communists during World War II and afterwards, you know, it took 70 years for that to make the light of day. This is the same thing that, that will happen with this.
the we had the ultimate uh, compliment again to Eric was when that, we put that crime <laughs> link chart on Rackstraw's lap in San Diego when we confronted him. Oh, he not only you. looked he not only looked at it, he looked right at Briggs, the drug dealer. Now remember my whole case was built on him being a seven year crime partner. Suddenly this guy's sitting there and I didn't even tell him it was about Cooper. I just said, Why are you in the middle of this? <laughs> and he looked he looked at it and he's looking at Briggs and he says, There's hey, there's Briggs. And I said, yeah, I knew you knew him. And he says, oh, he was a school teacher. Yeah, 10 years before he was a drug dealer. And he says, is he alive? And I said, you know he's not alive. That was a great confirmation. And the second one, he's looking at his army picture that we dug up in St. Louis in the vaults. You guys have seen the army picture, I assume, on the website. Yeah. That mm -hmm. The FBI did not have that picture when we met with them in the first year. They asked for a copy. It shows you how badly things were run in the 70s. We dug it. We sent it to them. That's what we put in the middle of the of the link chart. He's looking at the chart, at the picture. And, and remember, I haven't mentioned D.B. Cooper. I just said, you haven't seen that picture in a while, have you? And he goes, uh-huh. said, that was 14 months before the big day. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, and that's when I just had the, uh, you know, Another God hit. <laughs> Let me make sure I, I say this for my friends who are listening all over the world, by the way, that the man, <laughs> Eric Klein, uh, Eric Kleinsmith, was the one who did this link chart. So so we're talking to one oh. of the people that put evidence in front of Rackstraw that made him go, Briggs, yeah, let I me, know that guy. This is yep. the, the, how we created the chart is that you know, Tom came to me and he says, you know, out of frustration, he said, you know, we – we have 70 plus pages of a dossier that we built on this guy, but we can't get anybody to read it. You know, you put that on somebody's desk, like, yeah, right. I'm, I'm never going to read it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so Tom sends it over to myself and I got one of my uh, instructors. I was at the time I was doing, I was running a, a training program for the army for intelligence analysis using uh, data mining tools. And I went to one of my analyst notebook instructors and analyst notebook is one of the link analysis tools that the army currently still still uses but it's widely used in law enforcement and and, uh, and i gave it to this guy david d'alessio i said just take this raw information link it together create a chart and, you know and get it back to me and you know just you know we're gonna you know do it as you know as you can depending on your other duties well he comes back to me after a day and a half and he says i don't want to work on this anymore it's like why he goes this guy's killed people he's done bad things his entire <laughs> life and I was like, yeah, I forgot to tell you that he probably killed his stepfather and, and this other guy, too, that was his accomplice. I forgot, forgot to leave that little detail out. So he goes, I don't want to do this anymore. He's like, nah, you're good. Dude, just keep going. We're good. And so <laughs> after we got together, we went through several iterations of, of building this thing together, walking through the different, you know, making sure it's drawn out in the links. And, you know, and it, when you look at the chart, he's not the central person Dick Briggs is because he, Dick Briggs, became the, cent the center point in terms of, uh, the guy who knew everybody and the guy who was a linkage to everybody. So it was amazing. Well, not amazing, but it's highly coincidental. Uh, as, as Tom would say, there's no such thing as a coincidence, but it's highly coincidental that this guy ends up dead halfway through the story. So as we turn this chart back in, the chart turned into three feet by four feet that we plotted out in a huge printer. Now, again, from an intelligence standpoint, and Intel folks do not spy on, on Americans. We don't do anything. So we never went outside of the dossier that, that, uh, that Tom gave me. We built it purely based upon what he fed us and never did our own investigation on this guy. And I'm just making this clear as it almost as a CYA, just to make sure that we, you know, we did not perform any, any spy work on this guy as we built this. Uh, once we showed him that chart, I still have that same chart that he had in his, his hot little uh, hands uh, i got it rolled up and it's in my office right now so um, it's you know that's uh, it's part uh, of history it's a history it's part of history exactly right so yeah this seems like a minuscule detail but how much of the money was found very little uh we've had four separate people that claim rack straw was into cougar ants now, if you don't know, Cougarans was the uh, the money of the illicit trades back then in the 70s. 
and the South American coin. And the first one that told us, remember I told you I'm talking to drug dealers because we thought it was Briggs. Well, I got the brave up and, and finally went out and called the middleman, the guy who was running a car wash place and washing the money for Dick Briggs. He shared with, you know, he told me a story. Uh, he's now in his late seventies and not in great health. So he said, look, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not ashamed of what I did. I'll tell you anything you want to know. And he tells me that, uh, one day I was, uh, roommates with Dick Briggs. We were both divorced and we, I had a house, I let him move in and I'm working in a, you know, a financial company. I'm no, I'm not his middleman yet. And I come home one day and here's this guy with linebacker eyes named Robert Rackstraw sitting with him. Now, Robert Rackstraw was the floor manager at Pepperdine University laying the floor, and Dick Briggs invited him up to Portland into Jim Shell's house, Jim Shell, the future middleman. Hmm. And he said to me, and I looked down, and he's got a gunny sack stuffed with money. And I said, I don't know anything about this. And I went in my room and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What year was this? 74, two and a half, three years after the jump. And I said, so we've got Robert Rackstraw bringing a gunny sap up to him. Did your drug dealer deal with Cougarants? And he goes, yeah, he had two around his neck all the time. Then I find three women, three Come separate on. women in his life. I'm, t I'm, I'm telling you, and three separate women in his life. Uh, a couple of uh, one Hollywood producer who went after his story and was funding movies through cocaine trips to to down to Peru. Uh, another one was a girlfriend, and the third one was his ex-wife. All three of them bragged either directly to me or others. Yeah, uh, he had cougarants. In fact, the Hollywood dealer, Hollywood producer, had loaned him sixty thousand dollars bail, and he jumped uh, on this particular run. He had to pay it back, and, he, and she proudly said to me on the phone, yep, and he paid me in 60 grand worth of cougar ants. <laughs> now, you would think that's laying around. Well, we were told by – we got a call from a former veteran of Afghanistan who is now a PI in Southern California. And he said, I know a couple who had a boat right next to Rackstraw's boat. You'll love Rackstraw's boat. It was the 45-foot yacht he recently sold called Poverty Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that was his boat. Well, the neighboring boat, one day his third wife came over a little drunk and bragged that they had buried their cougarants in Southern California until they converted it later, according to court records, to property. Mr. Rackstraw had a 12 acre, lived on a 12 acre estate overlooking Lake Elsinore in Southern California, he and his third wife. And they went through a fake divorce. They never divorced. They went through a divorce in court, never left each other. He gave the 12 acres to her in front of the judge, said, Your Honor, I'm broke. Uh, six months later, she sold the 12 acres. A couple years later, she bought a million-dollar condo on Bankers Hill in San Diego. And guess who's, who was her roommate for the last 20 years of his life? No way. Rastra. Wow. Yep. We have all the court documents. And by the way, all along in this journey, as Eric knows, I'm offering uh, the parachute. I'm offering the court records of where the money went. We even found the coded letters, which you'll see up there. We brought the codes to the FBI. No comment. That's when we knew we had the CIA angle, and that's when we got – after we publicized all of this in uh, last year, a year ago, we suddenly get calls from uh, three of his former commanders in CIA and Army. You are truly annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that before. You know, I I I, I tell people, and it's all you, when you compliment our team or compliment me, you're complimenting our parents. Let's be honest. And I had I'm one of seven kids who are raised with three things, and that was we're here to help others, seek truth, and bring joy. I'm a master joke teller, so you know what that represents. Yeah. But I've also pursued the, tr the truth in in everything I do, and um, and that's what motivates me. And I know Eric has that same same type of caliber. Well, for one thing, every master joke teller, whether they're a TV producer or not, every master joke teller is a truth seeker because stuff is only. <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> 
but yeah, really that points to the level of detail that you went to in gathering this mountain of information and this enormous uh, brain trust. Yeah, and yeah. And and I was just brain trust and leaning on them. Well, I'm just the ringmaster here. Look, I used all this incredible talent. We brought them together like you guys do in the Army when you bring together some wonderful guys and gals under you. It's, you're lucky to have them, and you find out what they're good at, and you put them in place, and you just, you know, you become a, a wheel of judgment. And that's be, what we to did. To be fair, Eric had me, and I wouldn't put me anywhere near a wheel of judgment or anything other than <laughs> shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were Crazy the, Susan with bottles on it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Eric told me you were the radar of the company. Is that true? <laughs> oh, God, I did not say that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it paints a nice visual though. But but this the story of Rackstraw ends when? When did Rackstraw die? Just recently? Just two months ago. Two months ago. Okay. Seventy five so, years old. Uh, nat- uh, natural causes inside that condo. Horrific. Yeah, and that's uh, that's when things opened up, and 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 uh, it's a great way to to unless you guys have other questions, I'm obviously I, I'll never run out of things to talk about. But bottom line is, uh, the day he died, our incredible, phenomenal super attorney, and that's what the title they give them in Washington, Mark Zaid, went out, and he went right to the FBI in the courts and said, "Look, when a guy dies." His secrets and his privacy die with him. We want his file. Nine, we waited nine weeks, and the FBI was forced to give him up. We got him last week. That's why the papers are uh, uh, reacting to them now. Uh, everything we have in the book, and again, it's because of the 50 pages of endnotes in the back from our phenomenal sources, Everything in the book has been confirmed, and we've learned even more about the uh, incredible background of this man and the crimes he did around the world. And, oh, yeah, he was their prime suspect since day one. (laughs) There we go. So for our audience, the book is called The Last Master Outlaw, How He Outfoxed the FBI Six Times But Not a Cold Case Team. (laughs) <laughs> they details, didn't like that title, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't like that title. That, that is not a flattering title. But uh, once again, a truth seeker uh, lays out the truth. Uh, yeah. You know, this this uh, story has intrigued us for uh, two generations now. And, uh, you know, it's you on the one hand, uh, it's sad that he died, never had to pay pay the price to society. But you know, who who knows what price he really did have to pay indeed. And, and maybe some at someday we will know. It's almost, it's poetic. It's almost disappointing, uh, but it is justified. And it is, uh, there's a tremendous sense of closure somehow. Are you feeling, are you feeling closure? Is the team feeling closure? Oh, I absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Especially with his death file and everything that's been it's- revealed in it. It's if, if you spend the time and you read the book and you go through the outlying evidence that's been presented e- since since the book has been written, uh, I mean, I, and I say this all, uh, often as a joke, it's, it's like, if this guy didn't do it, OJ did it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would tell you that the book, uh, the, there, there are more than two dozen Cooper books. This one not only has the only ending, but it also has the only award, three awards for true crime. And that's not a compliment to me. It's to my co-author and Eric and all the team who made this book. And it's phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. I have a question for Eric. You know, yeah. us guys in the Intel community, you know, there's th- in Bosnia, I had a box full of booze, right? I mean, I could go out and I could drink when no one else could. There's certain allowances you know, you weren't supposed to drink that stuff, right? <laughs> oh, I didn't drink anything, sir. <laughs> He's spun it around on the lazy side. <laughs> but uh, are we mad at the CIA? No. Okay. No, and this, the thing is you, we've, we've run into a, you know, for, for whatever reason, and, you, and the thing is, is we will never, we won't know this for decades, why this, what he did and the exact details and why his, you know, you, you, you're in a covered program. You know it. It's just like the, the, these things for national security reasons, you know, they, they have to be, you know, they have to be protected. 
you know, it just so happens that the guy we ran into was able to use that as a blanket of security to grift his entire life. So it's, it's the weight of, do we want the truth out or do we want to jeopardize national security? You know, I mean, it's the same argument you run into with every single case from Snowden to whoever. Um, I would, I would also add to that, Eric, that the bottom line is they were desperate with the, with the building up of Iran Contra in early eighties. And this guy having two, what's the award, Eric, distinguished flying crosses. Yeah. Is that what they were? Yeah, right, he had right. two of them. He was the go-to guy for every general in Vietnam. They loved this guy. Right. So after he pulled the jump, they wanted him in Laos. They wanted him in Iran-Contra. He even was involved, right. I understand, in a prison rescue with a chopper in Mexico. I mean, it goes <laughs> on and on and on. Uh, no. no, the thing is, so, is no, under, yeah, under, understand, the guys who originally covered all of his activities, this was late 70s, you know, 70s and, and early 80s. These guys are not active working today. So the guys who are, you know, con- that are in the bureau or wherever, it's not that they don't want to just come right out and say, "Yeah, this is the guy." They're bound by law because yeah, somebody yeah. in a previous generation covered this guy. Right. Therefore, it's not like they can just say, "Oh, the heck with those guys. He doesn't work here anymore." No, no, no. They, he's bound by law to say that for whatever reason, we still have to cover this guy, no matter what. And- it's it's our duty. And understand that when Eric and I stood in front of FBI headquarters, just to rub a little salt, and announced the end of our case, and and I stated that the FBI has been covering up stonewalling and flat-out lying about the identity of D.B. Cooper and his background, uh, after we did that, Hollywood ran, not to us, straight to Rackstraw. They flew him up by Learjet. They tried to get him to sign a contract to tell the story of D.B. Cooper, but because he was pulled out of an FBI jail cell and put in Iran-Contra, he had a secret indictment. And the indictment said that he'd be going back to jail if he ever admitted it. And that's why they failed after offering him millions. He couldn't make a movie. <laughs> and that, that was last year. And uh, he uh, is frustrated that we went around. You know, look, we heard him, and you can hear it online in the audio video at the website, dbcooper.com. You can hear him say, when my reporter asks, why don't, you know, all we want to know is your story. And he says, sure, sure they would want to hear that. So would the FBI and the secret indictment. He literally says that on camera. (laughs) (laughs) And we didn't know what it meant in 2013. Right. Until, until last year. That's horrific. I want to say this, too, because I, when I asked Eric about, like, are we mad at the CIA? You know, guys like me who go into the field, I have to meet the most evil people on the earth so that right. we yep. can get to the stuff that will help us make bad things not happen. And sometimes right. the people that are good at doing that are, are, are ne'er-do-wells, you know? And yes. it's just, yes. it's exactly. a compromise, you know? And, and right. It, some of the worst field agents I ever met, and God bless you, these guys, were Mormons who would never eat medium rare pork and drink whiskey and smoke cigarettes to get intel. But I yeah. guarantee you, Rackstraw mm-hmm. had no problem doing that, and worse. Oh no, right? No, and and you know what? There are people like Rackstraw out there doing it for us now. Oh, but yeah. the bottom line is, I want them to come home and be an American. Yeah. That's the that's the cutoff right. point with right. the evil world out there, and. Thank God 90% of us do it that way, but it's that 10% we've got to keep an eye on. And look, this is a wink-wink between two agencies that they're embarrassed about to this day. Wow. And it seems like because there's not a lot more of those guys, they probably tightened up somewhat on what they allowed oh, yeah. to, to bud nipping, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you can bet they went back to check the classification guidance and the statute limitations and holding the I mean, all of that. Like I said, these guys are, they're just like, God, why can't we just end this? And, and, you know, this is a previous generation's embarrassment, not ours. Doesn't matter. You're still bound by it. And that's the worst part of it, guys. I always tell people, young reporters that call, I say, look, this is not about a bunch of old guys hunting down an old guy. It's about millennials right now covering up a 47-year crime just because they're doing a yes, sir. That's, that's incredible because none of these people are in. Right. Fascinating, man. Fascinating. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, and it's amazing because I, you know, I put out these articles on the, that, that will surface every so often, mostly at the prompting of Tom 
and I'll put them out on my, you know, on my Facebook feed or LinkedIn feed. I always get questions from friends and while we were talking today, I got a call from, I got a, a, a message from a reporter that I know um, who works downtown DC he said, you know what? I didn't know you, you were involved with this. Uh, you know, and I've been talking to this guy for, for years, helped him out with this book um, called The Watchers. Uh, and the guy's name is Shane Harris. He goes, I grew up in, he just texted me while we're online now. He just said, I am, I grew up in Portland. I've known about this since I was a kid. I've been fascinated with it ever since then. Uh, give me a call tomorrow when I want to hear more about it. And so that's why this is so, so it's still important to those who don't know anything about it. Well, I think it's also important, uh, Pete, to mention to the audience that this was all motivated by my wife and I sitting there saying we could make cold case teams for every one of the states just like this one. Right. And that is what has to happen. There are right. corporations that would love to fund it. There's Hollywood that would cover the new America's Most Wanted that comes out of it. And as my wife said in, in, at the time, and my wife, uh, I will share with you, is one of the heroes of my stories. We've been married 26 years, and her sense of justice is phenomenal. And she said to me, but there has to be a closure case on every episode. Yeah. In other words, one hunt, one court appearance, and one closure where a former cop or a former investigator walks up to a right. family's door and says, we know he died 10 years ago. We're here to offer our condolences. And that's what this show could be. That's how we stop the cold case disappearing. Right. The fact that this case starts off with a heist, uh, a jump yeah. from an airplane, all of the things <laughs> that captivated the, the, the folks who knew about the case uh, when it first happened, and the generation since. The only thing that could be sexier than a guy getting away with a crime with a backpack full of money, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute into the woods to disappear forever is the fact that it involved ultimately a clandestine handshake from the CIA that made the FBI wish an annoying TV producer would just go away. Well, my ambassadors, you mean. Right. Yes. <laughs> my 40 ambassadors. And, and frankly, that was done for self-preservation. I can't tell you how many former Intel guys came to me and said, Tom, you're going to get a, 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 you know, an umbrella point in your back someday. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, well, that's why I've surrounded myself with 40. They don't know what the hell to do with us because these are their mentors on the team. Yeah. That's the best part of this. People they respect. They can't diss us, and that's been the best part of this hunt. And it's terrific that you put that brain power to good use. There's so much in this, like he's living in San Diego on Knob Hill, you know. <laughs> Just think about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, he, he lived down. He had a stamp uh -huh. on his court documents when he challenged us in the FOIA. The stamp said, homeless and disabled veteran. Wow. <laughs> And that's because he saw, he gave the property to his wife, but no one knows that. That you, you think he's on a bench when you read that. And of course, and of course, the the, uh, the uh, Washington Post just put it right in the story without even looking. They didn't even bother looking at the book. We had that in the book that it was phony. I mean, a guy with living in a million dollar condo with a yacht and going to dog shows, and I mean. In, in biplane flights. The guy li was living on up down there, thanks to the CIA and everybody else. Yeah, a guy with an ID that identifies him as homeless, but he knows <laughs> that poverty sucks. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The one thing I'm taking away from this episode is that now that Mr. Rackstraw has passed, I'm going to take up the cause of, of dealing in cougarans. And I'm gonna oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are, and today they're called bitcoins. <laughs> well, right. There's that too, yeah. <laughs> you can't put that around your neck, though. No, you can't. <laughs> well, gentlemen, this is a fascinating story. Uh, hope you'll come back and we can dig some more. And the search for the truth is a noble search, and we're in it with you. Thanks. Thank Wonderful you. to be here. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming back. Thank you. Thank you.